Hello and welcome to this edition of Bayou Time. I'm your host, Keith Weissheit, licensed clinical social worker. Thank you so much for joining us. As we continue our discussion about Hurricane Ida recovery, a lot of that has to do with what's happening in and with our school systems. And we're always glad to welcome in some of our local leadership as we welcome back to the program, Jared Martin, uh, superintendent for Lafouche Parish Schools. Jared, thank you for joining us again. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Well, listen, people are, are, are asking lots of questions, are wondering what's going on. Can you just maybe give us an overview about kind of where things stand with uh, what's happened with some of the schools, where you stand, and some of the opening dates and possibilities? Absolutely. Um, and I'll begin with recapping the damage that we've, we've had in Lafourche Parish, uh, starting in the north and moving south. Um, Bayou Buff Elementary suffered tremendous damage because of flooding. Uh, some levees got overtopped in the Kramer community and Bayou Buff took on a significant amount of water. Um, Bayou Blue Elementary, um, moving a little further south, had significant damage. Uh, and a building had the entire roof pull, pulled off of it. Uh, and of course, all the contents below it get destroyed. Um, moving further south, we had roof damage at Central Lafourche High School, Lockport Schools, but then you get to North LaRose Elementary and uh, the, the entirety of uh, about a football field worth of roof was pulled off of that building. Um, and then LaRose Cutoff Middle School had significant damage. Golden Meadow Middle School, uh, just tremendous damage. Uh, the, the entirety of this very beautiful two-story uh, school that's got a lot of history and meaning to people in the community. Uh, the wood floors, there's a mounted lion in that area. The, the whole thing just really took a beating. And then, of course, the, uh, the one that's most impressive in terms of the amount of damage at South Lafourche High School. I was there again this morning and uh, we're working to get it all fixed, but it's gonna take some time. Um, and to answer the second part of that question, the reopening, we're, we're doing a phased reopening. Uh, the Thibodeau schools are up and running today and the students of Bayou Buff Elementary School have been split between uh, Sixth Ward Middle School and Shack Bay Elementary School and, and the principals of those three schools have just done a remarkable job navigating the communication to families, uh, the communication to teachers, and then welcoming students uh, into a completely different building and making it work. And so we're very, very proud of their efforts and, and happy to have the Thibodeau schools up and running. Uh, our teachers and staff members began returning to the Central Lafourche area schools this week. Uh, we continue to find problems as they return, and we're continuing to address those problems as they come up. And we're going to open school to students Monday of next week. But uh, we know that the schools, in many cases, they're not going to look identical to when the kids left uh, because there's still some damage that, that until we make permanent repairs, is going to be uh, part of our life going forward. And, and then, of course, moving to the reopening of the South Lafourche schools. Uh, that won't be any earlier than October 13th, we meet daily to discuss the progress and arrive at um, whether or not the 13th is even possible. Um, but we're optimistic that we can open school on the 13th and we are uh, moving toward that goal every day. Well, congratulations on those Thibodeau schools and getting those opened. And again, uh, I don't know that we can say enough about the leadership of, even in a grassroots effort, about making changes and getting the kids back to this, whatever this new normal is, you know. We, we talked about that several times about how we've dealt with COVID. And I, I guess if, if COVID did anything, it kind of prepared us to have more of a fluid opportunity for seeing what we needed to do kind of moving forward in these kinds of circumstances. You, you're exactly right. Uh, you know, when COVID first happened, I was anticipating a lot of pushback from teachers and and the reason is simple uh, teachers are planners and they want to know what they're doing november 2nd on you know on august 1st they they, they want a detailed list of things that they're going to do from day to day and of course covid threw that out of the window and, and and it was very stressful for teachers because they know what they need to get to they know how they need to get to it and they understand that teaching in many cases is building blocks um, and so COVID prepared us very well for change. Um, and, you know, growing up in South Louisiana, most of our teachers, like myself, we grew up with hurricanes. I remember Hurricane Juan, Hurricane Andrew, and many other storms that have impacted us greatly. So 
we have become accustomed to this, but this has been unlike any hurricane in my lifetime. And I think everyone has been, you know, realizing that to be true. And so the response is going to look vastly different. Yeah, it's really interesting as we uh, have about a minute and a half here in this particular segment. And uh, it's really interesting. I I'm glad you started with sharing the damage, as you mentioned, the significance of this particular hurricane uh, in the north and moving south. It, it just seemed like the the damage got worse and worse the closer we got down to Lower La Rose, uh, Lower La Fouche. Yeah, you're exactly right. Um, the the Golden Meadow community um, and and those communities just north of Golden Meadow, and, and let's not forget the communities south of Golden Meadow. Right. Um, that they're, they're hammered. There's just no way to describe the devastation without seeing it for yourself. Pictures don't do it justice when you see a street that used to have eight um, structures on it, and now it's it's eight piles of rubble. Um, it's it's an emotional thing to see. It's it's a draining thing to have to deal with, and I can't imagine being those families directly directly impacted by it. You know, Jared, talking a little bit about some of the damage that's been done, uh, we can't really overlook the efforts of some of the people in those areas and, and just trying to get the schools ready and prepared. And there's been a lot of work that's going into uh, being able to open some of those schools. It's been, it's been a daunting task, make no mistake about it. And what usually is the protocol following a hurricane, um, principals return back into the area along with their custodial staff. They do some assessments and then we begin the cleaning up process with our own maintenance team. Uh, to get schools back up and running, get the air conditioners up and running as soon as we're able to get power. And if we're not able to get power, in some cases, hook up generators so that we can stabilize the atmosphere. This hurricane didn't allow for any of that. Uh, the damage was such that the buildings were not safe for our principals or our custodial staff. And so we had to lean on uh, some pre-existing contracts we had with some water mitigation uh, specialists to come in and do not only assessments, but the mitigation of all of the damaged area to stabilize the atmosphere in those buildings uh, and to begin the cleanup process. We had help from um, dozens of contractors, over probably 300 contractors are still in Lafouche Parish today uh, between debris removal, the stabilization of the atmosphere in our buildings, the cleaning of the walls, the re-roofing and putting temporary roofs in our buildings. Uh, it has been a tremendous effort uh, that's been organized by my my maintenance staff and of course our office uh plays a direct role in that nowadays uh i made jokes from you know day three or four that i, I never knew as a superintendent i was going to become one of the largest general contractors in in the parish but that's really what we've become yeah uh, because of the amount of work that has to get done uh and we've got to get it done very very quickly well and y'all have moved very quickly I, I guess the other piece that that people need to know about is the efforts that have been made for our, our student athletes and making sure that they've been able to have some opportunities that you've had to create opportunities in, in a world where there weren't, really aren't any with regards to the significant and extensive damage. That's right, that's right. So all of the efforts that we put in uh, to get these buildings up and running, they're, they're, they're all done to service students uh, from an academic standpoint. and. And of course, athletics is an important part of our students' lives. Um, and so what we were able to do early on, we recognized that we wanted to get athletics up and running, but we were not going to do it if we could not guarantee the safety of our students and not pull resources needed uh, to serve the greater community. Uh, hosting a football game, for example, takes valuable not only medical personnel to supervise and provide immediate attention to it, but it also requires the sheriff's office to support that event. So we didn't want to pull resources, but we wanted to uh, facilitate those events to the extent that we could. So the efforts that went into standing up athletics were, were tremendous. Um, we entered into contract with some folks in Texas to number one, grab all of our equipment, have it professionally sanitized and then return back to the athletic directors. The athletic directors came up with a process to guarantee uh, student safety by making sure we had ice and water. We had to have open lines of transportation uh, so that we can get to and from our practice facilities. We had to have clean facilities that the students would be able to use. And we had to make sure that we had clean serviceable equipment for the kids. So once we established what those 
uh, criteria are for reopening. We, we set the schools on a path to develop how they were going to secure those resources. And once they were able to secure them, uh, we began full operations. I, I saw just recently, I haven't been able to make one of the events yet, but I look forward to doing so that our volleyball teams are back up and running. Our football teams are back up and running and we look forward to a full basketball season. But what's going to happen is that we're going to have to share facilities and we're still going to have to uh, be very creative in how we do that. Um, and this is going to extend down to also our middle school students. Um, we're going to have a middle school football season, middle school volleyball season. My daughter is looking forward to uh, being a part of the Lockport Middle School volleyball team. And so we want to give kids every opportunity to have the full experience that they are deserved. Um, but the seasons may be a little shorter um, than they were, but we're definitely going to have the season. With middle school sports, we have a lot of latitude uh, because they are not LHSA sanctioned sports. We can move them around as we need to. Uh, the complication comes from high school sports. And I had spoken to the LHSAA director, Eddie Bonine, early in the hurricane. And he was very gracious and, and assured us that we wouldn't forfeit any games that we were not, not able to participate in and that we would be able to jump right back into the LHSAA contest as soon as we were able. Well, some tremendous work has been done. And it just it echoes the resiliency of not only you and your team, but but our communities being dedicated to having this next new normal, whatever that is. And so just in the, in the last minute or so of this particular segment, maybe talk about the resilience of your team and, and the communities and how they've come together. Well, I'm just so proud of where we are. Um, and I know that we're going to be in a very good place. Uh, every day is better than the last. We're, we continue to make progress and we're going to continue to make progress. But at the same time, um, there was a shortage of labor. And there was a shortage of materials before the hurricane. Uh, now that this hurricane has come into the area and wreaked all kinds of havoc, not only to the terrible and Lafourche communities, but our friends in St. Charles, St. John, St. James, and Jefferson have also suffered a tremendous amount of damage. The amount of raw materials being pulled uh, from the market is tremendous. And so the labor market and the materials market is such that our rebuild process is going to be a long one. And so I would ask that people are patient as we begin this process because it's going to be a long one. Uh, but I guarantee it will be built back better than it was before. I can't thank you enough for joining us. Really, really appreciate your time this morning, Jared. And again, thank that's you. Jared Martin with Superintendent Lafouche Parish Schools. We thank him so much. We take a break. More from Bayou Time when we return.